So I, I start with, with, with my lecture, which has some main points. Um, I effectively diverge a little bit from, uh, from Noriel. The fact that I come from the uh, same sort of background, um, uh, I mean, same mentality, but I was a trader for a long time, and I was a currency trader for a long time. I was going to be a gold trader for a while. So, and I'm going to tell you, there are things about gold that, 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 that if, if I convince you gold is not a currency, then you realize Bitcoin is even less of a currency and even less of a store of value. So my main point is that number one, a currency must never be a speculative investment. Visibly, you, you need a currency to uh, be fixed with respect to some kind of index of goods and services that you consume. The second point is a store of value must have arbitrage bound, so it doesn't become speculative. Uh, and, and, and effectively, a stock has arbitrage bound. Uh, if the stock becomes too cheap, you can uh, liquidate uh, and, and, and you know, the company as uh, corporate raiders did in the 80s. And if the stock uh, price becomes too expensive, competitors will come in offering goods that substitute in a free market, of course. And then uh, the, the third point, transactional flexibility does not require complete decentralization. I was sold on Bitcoin. I was sold on cryptos in the beginning. Why? Because to me, it was a logical extension of the internet. I'm doing a transaction with peers. They accept I realized that something completely 100% decentralized doesn't do anything for us. I mean, so what? You don't want a custodian because you're paranoid that they're going to be a custodian? You know, the, 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 in, in 37 years of trading, I haven't seen anybody complain about the custodian or anybody worry about the custodian. So that's not the, the problem is. The problem is irreversible transactions. And then for uh, the fourth point is hopefully you have time to discuss how to build a true store of value or inflation hedge. And, and in fact, what I come with a different perspective from Muriel is that I don't really like governments to own currencies. I come from a more libertarian standpoint, and I want to try to convince libertarians that Bitcoin is not the thing that they should rally uh, for. So uh, <clears throat> one thing, what can we learn from gold? Because effectively, gold has been demonetized. And, and for those who have a short memory or were not born in 1971, the United States abandoned the gold standard. And you don't abandon it by accidents. There are a lot of reasons. Uh, why we abandoned it. But let's see what happened after. Okay, I mean, one of the reasons why we abandoned, of course, the gold standard is that there's not enough gold to keep up with economic activity. And gold has a natural ability to, de to demonetize itself because a lot of it goes to jewelry, a lot of it, some of it, uh, half jewelry, one eighth industrial uh, use, which can increase at lower prices. And then, of course, you have. Uh, uh, the, the, the financial aspect of storage uh, via central banks of gold that, that consumes, you know, about between 25 and, and, and 40 percent. So between, between central bankers and uh, investors. So, so you realize there's not enough gold to have a gold standard because GDP is growing and population is growing. So they abandoned it. Or there may be another reason why they abandoned it, so they can print money. Whatever the reason is, it was abandoned. But let's say what happened after. The picture I have here is the, the Hunt brothers who started Cornick Silver. And, and you'll see why silver was more of a currency than gold. Uh, and, and also when they started in, in the early 70s uh, hoarding uh, silver, uh, uh, United States citizens were uh, not allowed to hold gold. So look at the price of ha what happened to silver. My problem as someone who likes uh, you know, to work with volatility, like stale tail hedges, like risk-based uh, uh, measures, is that when you see something go up uh, 10 times, both gold and silver went up big time, okay? You, you don't want, it's no longer hedging anything. And of course, became a speculative item. That pretty much killed gold. Because those who bought gold in the 80s, in, in the, in the uh, you know, that period, during that period of time, from 78, say, to uh, 81, those of old gold still have not recovered their value adjusted for inflation. Now, it's still, gold is the best inflation hedge, but, you know, it gets, it's, it's too volatile. Uh, even gold is too volatile for us. So it's a good hedge for 5%, 10% of your portfolio, something you use, but it cannot be an inflation hedge. So that, you know, and I'm making a case against Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies based on gold as a store of value. So, so gold, the other problem is, for those who think in terms of fiat and government and all that thing, is that gold 
uh, displaced silver. Uh, silver was more commonly the currency in French. Uh, argent means uh, money, and in Spanish plata. And, and, and you had uh, even silver standards in some countries versus gold standards. So gold was more like for storage uh, by kings and by governments. So it was really the first fiat thing, governmental uh, concept, whereas silver was more of a popular one. And you had a lot of small little countries. But I'll, I'll come, in, come in here with, a, uh, with, a, with, a, with an argument against those who libertarians who think that transactions should be analyzed pairwise by telling them, listen, the, one of the greatest French minds, and, one, and definitely the greatest libertarian mind, Bastiat, himself tried to teach people to think in second order, third order, fourth order terms, or in terms of interactions. That if I were to buy something in Bitcoin, if I want to buy a, 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 a bottle of Coca-Cola in Bitcoin, or in a cryptocurrency that's considered a currency, the supplier must pay the truck drivers in that currency. Therefore, you end up having liabilities in, in a currency that's not matched by the currency of revenues. Unfortunately, we are moving towards a unified currency, which is made stable by a supply of assets and supply and, and an increase in liabilities that need to be matched. If you have, I mean, just consider, I mean, of course, nobody, nobody prices dancing in Bitcoin, but consider that if you have a fixed Bitcoin, uh, uh, floating dollars, uh, price of, of anything that that uh, you know you would have had your rent increase uh, by hundred, uh, you know, by by hundred uh, percent over uh, you know the first part of this year, and then collapse uh, right after. So you can't really price goods and services. Uh, le uh, lenders, you know, cannot you know find borrowers and something like that. So so it is not usable, and we're converging to a sort of a unified currency. Because of uh, we're converging to a unified currency because of uh, <coughs> the increase of GDP that is attributable to the state. So uh, today, places like France and Europe have, uh, depending how you count, 50 to 55 percent of the GDP uh, expressed in you know sorry related to the state and therefore must be expressed in the state's currency. And, and if the government pays salaries in uh, euros, well, guess what? You're going to have you know, to uh, uh, sell goods in euros because that, that's a big uh, customer base that you'd lose otherwise. So, so th therefore, you have displacement of the other currencies by, by that of the state. And, and we're going to have to live with that and, and fix, try to fix what we can. One view about Bitcoin that really turned me off and then started this process of trying the uh, investigation, figuring out why it can be there, neither, uh, cannot be a currency nor a hedge or, nor anything, is look at Zvalto. See on the left picture, it stayed constant or, or, and, and very high, close to 100%, between 70 and 100% per annum, annualized volatility. And, uh, but on the right, I had volatility of capitalization. <laughs> You see, at, at higher level, Bitcoin should drop in volatility, otherwise it have a bigger, bigger impact. Because when something has a trillion, 1.3 trillion capitalization, a volatility of 100% is not good for anyone. You see, so in, in, in other words, the impact of that volatility is, is very large on the economy. Now, the question is, I'm looking for an inflation hedge. How do you build an inflation hedge? This is a technical thing. Uh, Nouriel said it, you have uh, set goods and services that you want to index, and you want to find something that's stable to these goods and services that would be more stable than fiat money in the long run. Good idea, but uh, how do you build it? Well, there was something that naturally sprang in Italy called the Cetoni. I'm sure Nouriel, when he was a student or a high school student as well in Italy, used the Cetoni. The Cetoni is a, is, is a, a um, coin that was used for telephone uh, you know, to use, you know, for this. Uh, so it was, you know, a fixed, you could buy espresso with Jetoni, and it was fixed. So the, the lira, the Italian lira, would be uh, devalued, but the Jetoni kept the same uh, the purchasing power. Except, look what happened. What happened to phone calls, the price of the phone call over the past 20 years? 
So there's a Tony as a debt. So you cannot track inflation because technologies come in and change that whatever you buy with a good service. It's a floating uh, thing, as I showed in my in my earlier uh, in my earlier uh, uh, technical slide. So we have a, a problem now with uh, trying to figure out uh, what can I use as inflation hedge or where can I find stability. And again, I'm coming in from a libertarian standpoint. I you know, as the state for me is the last resort thing. The state should not be uh, the first resort, the last resort thing. And and, so, and as Hayek said, sometimes you have to accept the state as necessary for pandemics, wars, and much of things. So let's see what happened here with a little parable. Everybody knows the story of the, the, the Jesus in the temple. Jesus walked in the temple and he was horrified at the, by the presence of money changers and turned the, through the table and, and had a big fit. Now the question is, why were there changers in the temple? Why? Because the temple only took one currency, the uh, shekel of Tyre, or thekel. Uh, so the, 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 current, the silver currency, by the way, of Tyre, and it was known to be a stable currency. <laughs> So the temple and you know, it only accepted that for, as, as, as gifts. So all gifts had to be, you came in with your currency, whatever you had, okay? And you could the Roman denarii or some other currency at the time. You come in and change it to the shekel of time. That's what they accepted. And it has very good reputation. Now, in my experience as a currency trader, there was a shekel of tire equivalent and it was called the Swiss franc where you guys are. And unfortunately, yeah, Switzerland has gone, you know, got too successful to stay, to stay, to stay <laughs> the way it was. So Switzerland is no longer Switzerland, but still close to the earlier one, where people had anchor currencies. So you, you could use things for daily uh, uh, chores, and you used a, uh, uh, an anchor currency for, you know, to translate investments, project things over time, uh, make plans. And it was the Deutsche Mark or the Swiss franc depending on if you're south of uh, Switzerland, like Italy was uh, Swiss franc, from my experience, the French was the Deutsche Mark. So they had always had a German problem. So, uh, so uh, now we're going to think about it, is why are currency exchanges stable? Well, because commerce makes them stable. For the same thing, things become interactive. Think like Bastia. If Bastia were alive today, he would be telling you that there are interactions you had to take into account. And he would tell you that you, you need to... <laughs> Uh, 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 look at this, you know, have a stability of these uh, currencies be between one another. And, and if effectively, when you look at uh, uh, Singapore, very stable currency against the dollar, Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, if when you trade a lot, that forces it. Because think, let's think of what can happen if the Swiss franc went up uh, 10 times with respect to the euro, and they have a country next door, France. And you have uh, a free exchange. If you have free exchange, no Swiss person, and no matter how patriotic, would buy anything in Switzerland. You go buy everything in France. So then you'd have currency adjustments, and uh, the real specialty of how these mechanisms of adjustment take place will bring back the currency in line, the currencies in line. So there are mechanisms that make, make us comfortable with currencies. And instead of saying, oh, I don't want fiat currency, you say, let the fiat compete with one another for stability as has happened in the past and what's happening now. We compete with one another, compete with gold. So what we're having now is a phenomena uh, called the bubble. And, and the way uh, I, I, I look at bubbles is uh, uh, you know, quite different from, from the, how people are defining them. For, for me, it's something that does not have an arbitrage upper bound because it resists, and, and, and if it has no arbitrage upper bounds, the fad can, you know, like the tulip, uh, you know, end up uh, reaching crazy levels. But uh, Bitcoin, unlike the tulip, uh, doesn't have, a, you know, uh, an immediate substitute, the cryptos don't have an immediate substitute, but they have competitors, okay, in a crypto space. People may fall in love with something else. There are 10,000 cryptos, you're gonna, switch from one crypto to another. So it cannot be a store of value, okay? Uh, so therefore, the way I view uh, what's happening here is uh, it's more, much more of a religious experience for a group of people. And you know what happened with the religious sects? I, I see what you're having here, uh, you know, sects, sects 
cutting from one another. Uh, then you have heresies and, and other heresies, and these people want this, other people want that, and, and you have to say, but it is to me, I, I, view, I don't view it as, as, as anything but neo-pagan worship, because, uh, you, and, and, and like anything like that, it's, people are finicky, they will, they will love something else, it's just like the art market, the art market does not store a value, why? Not just because it's still volatile, but because if you're in 1900, you, uh, you, you're trying to collect art, you would have collected uh, you know, something like old masters, and then you pass it on to your descendants, and your descendants say, oh, you know, look at the price of Picasso versus this, okay? And then sure enough, the next generation will probably won't know what uh, Picasso means. You know, everything's probable then in this world. So the, uh, uh, so, so we're, we're, we, so the, the, the reason um, uh, we have to be wary of these things is that you know, over time we've made mistakes. We made mistakes with gold, and then we corrected them. Now we know what gold is good for, and not for. And and we'll close with, uh, have, with this uh, following uh, story: is I call the smartest person I know who uh, likes uh, cryptos. Okay, and uh, I called him yesterday and I asked him, "Listen, uh, give me an argument." And he told me, "Well, if th the world goes to hell, at least I can use Bitcoin." Unfortunately, I'm in the risk business, particularly the tail risk business. And I'm going to tell you one thing. You don't, and you don't have to have observed what happened last March, uh, the March before last, last with, uh, with, uh, with COVID. But this is not an inflation hedge. Uh, so sorry, this is not a tail risk hedge. Cryptos are not tail risk hedges. That's my profession. Thank you for listening to me.